On February 14, 1990, Indian Airlines Flight 605 was minutes from landing in Bangalore. The runway was in sight. The approach looked routine, but inside the cockpit, one small error had already set the aircraft on a path it couldn't recover from. A single knob turned at the wrong moment sent the Airbus quietly drifting off course. Below them, just beyond the runway, lay the Karnataka Golf Club, and that's where the flight was headed. With each passing second, the gap between the aircraft and safety narrows. Can the crew save all 146 lives on board? Let's find out. This is the story of Indian Airlines Flight 605. Indian Airlines, a government-owned domestic carrier, had recently begun replacing its aging 737 fleet with the cutting-edge Airbus A320. Introduced in 1988, the A320 was the first airliner to feature a fly-by-wire system. Pilot stick movements are converted into electrical signals, processed by computers and only then move the control surfaces. Traditional yokes were replaced by side sticks and analog dials gave way to six digital displays. Airbus claimed this made flying easier and safer. But many pilots raised concerns. The reliance on automation and abstracted controls made it harder to understand what the plane was actually doing, especially in high-stress situations. Flight 605 would become one of the first major tests of this new philosophy. In the cockpit were two pilots transitioning to the Airbus A320. In the left seat was 44-year-old Captain Cyril Fernandez, a seasoned Boeing 737 pilot with nearly 7,000 hours of flight experience, but just 68 hours on the A320. This was his first official line check flight. Evaluating him from the right seat was 49-year-old Captain Satish Kopuchka, a veteran with over 10,000 hours he had completed Airbus training the previous year and logged 255 hours on the A320. As a designated training captain, he was responsible for supervising new A320 pilots during their transition. Their flight, Indian Airlines 605, was part of a larger rollout. In 1989, the airline began replacing its 737s with 18 brand new Airbus A320s. But under Indian law, Pilots needed 100 hours as first officer on a new aircraft type before upgrading to captain, and there were no A320 captains in India. The solution? Send experienced 737 captains like Kupuchka to Airbus headquarters in Toulouse, France for direct A320 training. Upon returning, they were certified as instructors, able to train others back home. Fernandez was among the next group. After completing simulator and ground training in France, he returned to India to begin his final check flights. His first, a short domestic leg from Bombay to Bangalore on February the 14th, 1990. Indian Airlines Flight 605 took off from Bombay at 11.58 a.m. with 139 passengers and seven crew members aboard. The flight climbed to cruising altitude and continued uneventfully towards Bangalore. At 12.53 p.m., the crew contacted Bangalore Control and was cleared for a visual approach to Runway 9. Understanding the events that took place during the descent into Bangalore requires some basic knowledge about how to fly the Airbus A320. The A320 is built around auto flight systems. Pilots guide the plane using a combination of autopilot, auto thrust, and flight management computers often without touching the controls. These systems operate in different modes, which pilots must monitor and manage constantly. There are two main ways to fly the plane. Managed mode, where the computer follows a programmed path, and selected mode, where the pilots manually set things like heading, altitude, or speed. During descent, one important selected mode is vertical speed. Here, the pilots choose how fast the plane should descend, and the auto thrust adjusts engine power to keep the speed steady. Another is open descent, OPDES, which sets the engines to idle while the plane pitches down to descend. In this mode, speed is controlled mostly by adjusting the aircraft's nose, not engine power. 
Keeping track of which modes are active is crucial, and during Flight 605's approach, this would become a critical factor. As Flight 605 approached Bangalore, the crew found themselves slightly above the glide path, a routine situation that's usually corrected by increasing the rate of descent. To do this, Captain Fernandez selected open descent mode, which lowered the nose of the plane, while the engines stayed at idle. The target was 4,600 feet on the altimeter, about 1,700 feet above the runway at Bangalore, as cleared by air traffic control. In this mode, the engines don't automatically adjust to control speed, so it was up to Fernandez to watch his flight director, visual cues on his screen showing whether to pitch the nose up or down. By following those cues, he kept the plane at the correct approach speed of 132 knots. As the plane neared its target altitude of 4,600 feet, the vertical mode shifted to ALT, short for altitude capture, a transitional mode where the aircraft levels off and waits for the next command. Captain Gopuchka announced the mode change, prompting Captain Fernandez to say, OK, give me go around, requesting that Gopuchka set the missed approach altitude of 6,000 feet into the system. Go around you want? At this point, Flight 605 was still above the glide path, but Fernandez likely didn't mean to initiate a go-around. He probably just wanted the altitude pre-selected in case they needed it. 6,000, Fernandez confirmed. Or do you want vertical speed? Kapuchka replied. But for unknown reasons, he never entered the 6,000-foot altitude. Fernandez accepted the suggestion. Vertical speed, how much? 1,000 a slightly steeper descent rate to rejoin the glide path. Kapuchka then set a 1,000 foot per minute descent using the vertical speed knob, switching the vertical mode to vertical speed. This also triggered the auto thrust to return to speed mode, actively maintaining their approach speed of 132 knots. Without mentioning it, Kapuchka also adjusted the target altitude to 3,300 feet the minimum altitude for that segment of the approach. As the plane approached 3,300 feet, the vertical mode once again shifted to ALT as the system prepared to level off. At this point, they'd intercepted the glide path, but were starting to drift below it. Captain Fernandez asked Kapuchka to reduce the descent rate to 700 feet per minute. Missed approach, yes, Kapuchka began. What happened next remains uncertain with two main theories proposed. One suggests that Kapuchka began setting the missed approach altitude of 6,000 feet, but realized this would activate open climb. To avoid that, he quickly dialed the altitude knob downward, possibly to zero, selecting a value below ground level. In alt mode, doing this would trigger open descent. The other theory holds that Kapuchka had his hand on the altitude knob when Fernandez asked for a 700 foot descent rate. Mistakenly, he may have spun the altitude knob to 700 instead of using the vertical speed knob. That too would have engaged open descent, since 700 feet was well below their current altitude. Either way, the result was the same. The system switched to open descent, and the plane began a rapid drop toward the ground, with the engines still at idle. Because open descent no longer holds the selected 700 feet per minute rate, the actual sink rate now floated with airspeed, sliding to roughly 600 feet per minute as the jet slipped further beneath the glide path. With open descent mode active, the plane's descent rate increased, and it continued to drift below the glide path. In this mode, the engine stayed at idle and it was up to Captain Fernandez to follow the flight director to control speed. But Fernandez didn't realize the mode had changed and made no effort to maintain airspeed. As a result, the plane slowed below the target of 132 knots and continued to sink. About 11 seconds later, Captain Kapuchka noticed the issue and said, You're descending in idle. Open descent. Ha! All this time. The radio altimeter then called out, 300, warning that they were just 300 feet above the ground. Knowing that open descent disables autothrust speed control, Kapuchka had an idea. Turning off both flight directors would reset the system to speed mode, 
restoring automatic speed control at 132 knots. You want the flight directors off now? Yeah, Fernandez replied, switching off his flight director. Okay, I already put it off, but you did not put off mine, the butch car said. That likely caused confusion. Turning off both flight directors was the job of the pilot not flying. Fernandez didn't respond, and Kapuchka never switched off his own. The result? Fernandez lost his flight director guidance, but open descent mode remained active because one flight director was still on. Their attempt to reset the system to speed mode had failed and had only made the situation worse. 200, the radio altimeter called. They were now 174 feet below the glide path, only about 175 feet above the ground, instead of the roughly 350 feet they should have had. Still descending at 600 feet per minute, airspeed had dropped to just 118 knots and falling. At around 175 feet above ground level, Fernandez finally appeared to realize something was wrong. He began pulling back on his side stick, likely trying to initiate a climb. You are on autopilot still? Seemingly confused as to why auto thrust hadn't switched modes. It's off. Suddenly, Kapuchka saw the ground rushing up towards him. Hey, we're going down. At that exact moment, the A320's Alpha Floor Protection, an automatic safeguard that detects an impending stall and instantly commands full thrust, triggered spooling the engines towards maximum power to keep the wings flying. But from idle, the engines needed eight seconds to reach maximum thrust. They didn't have that much time. Captain, Captain, still going. Then the ground proximity warning system blared. Sink rate. Fernandez shoved the throttles forward, unaware that the Alpha floor protection had already done the same. It was too late. Just seconds later, Indian Airlines Flight 605 slammed into the Karnataka Golf Club, touching down 2,300 feet short of the runway. At first, some passengers and flight attendants believed it was a normal landing. That illusion lasted only a moment. The plane bounced back into the air, clipped the tops of nearby trees, and crashed down again near the 17th green. It then plowed straight into a four-meter-high earthen embankment, ripping off the landing gear, both engines, and tearing apart the forward fuselage, where ruptured fuel tanks exploded into flames. Inside the cabin, chaos erupted. Most passengers survived the initial impact, but many were injured, and the fire began spreading almost immediately. A flight attendant opened the left rear exit, and people rushed to escape. Others used the two overwing exits on the left side, while a few found a break in the fuselage near the front. But for many seated toward the front, there wasn't enough time. Flames overtook the cabin before they could reach an exit. Among those trapped were Captains Kapuchka and Fernandez, seen trying to open a cockpit window before the fire consumed them. By the time fire crews arrived, it was too late. The blaze had already swept through most of the fuselage. Of the 146 people on board, 56 initially made it out alive. Two of those survivors later died in hospital, leaving 54 people who ultimately lived and bringing the final death toll to 92. At least 83 of them perished in the fire, not the crash, although many had sustained serious injuries that may have prevented their escape. As the first crash of an Airbus A320 in regular passenger service, just two years after a fatal demonstration flight in 1988, the accident drew significant international attention. The Indian government appointed Justice Shiva Shankar Bhatt to lead the investigation, amid widespread speculation that the A320's advanced automation may have played a role. In the aftermath, Indian Airlines was asked to ground its remaining 17 A320s. Facing mounting financial losses, the airline eventually chose to sell them off entirely. But what happens when the warnings come too late? When the clock is already ticking? When smoke creeps into the cockpit? And every second becomes a decision that matters. That story is next. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more aviation stories.